Hi, everyone. Um, let me introduce myself first. Um, my name is Sarah Dion. I'm the co-director of the IDDC, which is the Interdisciplinary Global Development Center. We are extremely pleased to welcome you uh, at this roundtable for today, which is on queering international development, addressing heteronormativity in development policy and practice. I will just briefly introduce uh, the center which is hosting this event before I hand over to the chair of this event in a moment. Um, so the IDDC is an interdisciplinary uh, learning and research community for equitable global development based at the University of York. We undertake interdisciplinary research in collaboration with our partners on social justice, global health and sustainable environments. And we also offer undergrad and postgrad academic programs in global development. The center brings together researchers from across the different disciplines, um, humanities, social science and natural sciences within the University of York, but also globally. And we work together um, as researchers with one another, but also very importantly with policymakers, activists and practitioners to address different global development challenges. So the last thing you will hear from me today is to uh, is for me to introduce and welcome our chair for today, um, Dr. Saba Joshi, who is a lecturer in gender and development in the Department of Politics and a member of the IDDC at the University of York. Her current research focuses on gender and international relations, uh, dispossession of land and agrarian change with a specific geographical focus on South and Southeast Asia. Welcome Saba, I pass the floor to you uh, for the introduction of this event today. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's roundtable, which is being organized by the IGDC to mark LGBTQIA History Month uh, this month, February. Um, so we have a fantastic lineup of speakers that will be discussing our topic, which is queering international development, addressing heteronormativity in development policy and practice. And they will be drawing on their individual and collective experiences in activism, uh, organizing, research, and art. Uh, before I move on to uh, introducing our panelists, um, I'd like to just mention a few housekeeping points, um, specifically uh, for our audience members who are here today. So um, for your information, this session is being recorded, but only the video and audio of the panelists. So um, attendees' mics are muted and your videos are off, so you won't be recorded. The only information that might be recorded are if, if you put in any questions um, into the question and answer um, button, uh, the section. Uh, and uh, so your name might appear because of uh, your Zoom name. So that's the only part that might be recorded for you. So um, to answer questions, there is a button um, at the bottom bar, uh, which is, says Q&A. So the panelists, um, you can you know, continue adding uh, questions throughout the round table. And uh, that's the only function through which you'll be able to ask questions. So, uh, and you're also able to vote on other questions. So if you see somebody that has asked an interesting question that you would like um, the panelists to answer, so just, upvoted um, and um, so the, the questions that will receive the most votes will be answered first. Um, um, and those of you that are on Twitter, you can fi uh, find and follow us at uh, IGDC, York underscore IGDC. Uh, and for the webinar, you can, um, you can use the hashtag, hashtag IGDC webinar. Now on to the webinar and I'll start off by introducing all our speakers uh, who are here with us today. So, First and foremost, we have uh, Dessa Lewin, who currently works as a research fellow in the Participation, Inclusion and Social Change Cluster at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. And her work uh, focuses on queer visual activism, feminism, gender, sexuality, uh, children and part participatory methodologies. Our second speaker, um, this uh, afternoon is uh, Joel Modi, and Joel is a social worker and a health advocate and the founder of MIF Nigeria, a youth-led NGO, and was previously a UN youth delegate. And Joel has, um, was the organizer of Nigeria's first ever Pride event, um, but following pers uh, potential persecution, he um, has been granted refugee status in the UK where he is currently based. Um, our third uh, speaker is Rajesh uh, Srinivas, and Rajesh is the executive director of Sangama, an organization working for the rights of working class, uh, sexual minorities, sex workers, and people with, um, living with HIV. 
And Sangama has been active since 1999 and is based out of Bangalore in Karnataka in, in India. And our fourth and final speaker is Dr. Matthew Waits. Uh, Matthew is a reader in sociology based at the University of Glasgow and his research focuses on global politics of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender human rights. And uh, Dr. Waits has also represented the University of Glasgow in the creation of, um, of a project to support LGBT um, inclusion in five African cities. So welcome uh, to all our distinguished panelists today. And I will uh, pass on the floor to Dessa, um, who will be our first speaker today. And the questions, like I said earlier, you can keep uh, entering the questions in the question answer box and uh, each of our speakers will speak and then we will uh, address your questions. So over to you, Dessa. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Slightly intimidating going first. Um, anyway, uh, could I have the next slide, please? So I'm based at the Institute of Development Studies. I convened the MA in Gender and Development there, and I run um, two projects, one called Rejuvenate, which is on uh, children and young people, and another one, um, I convened the policy and practice strand of um, a countering backlash. Um, project with a bunch of colleagues that I've worked with for a very long time. Um, I particularly like Korea Pachetsky and Parker's work, and this is a quote that I use a lot in teaching, which is that a division between erotic justice and social justice, and consequently between movements for sexual rights and those that aim at economic development and ending poverty and wars, derives from an epistemological error that extracts intimate bodily experience from its social matrix. Such division makes no sense in the context of real people's lives. Um, next slide, please. And I was kind of thinking about what to say today and feeling slightly uncomfortable because I've had a very unconventional um, career, mostly in, in development, but um, in kind of odd pockets in a way. I um, was a communications and participatory facilitator for many years. Um, I was an HIV and AIDS kind of activist from university onwards. I grew up in Zimbabwe um, and studied in, in South Africa and then came here and um, I'm now uh, an academic, um, albeit somewhat reluctant one at times. And um, I have kind of, I guess queer politics has has always been present in my life, but has come to occupy centre stage both in my thinking and in, in my practice. Um, and I was kind of plotting out the bits of um, queer and development that I've been involved with just to try and get my head around um, what, what I want to say. And I was thinking about big events that have kind of influenced my own development in this area. One of them was the Zimbabwean International Book Fair. Um, I was at university um, when Mugabe kicked out GALS, the Gay and Lesbian uh, Society of Zimbabwe from the book fair in 1995 and it had a big impact on, on all of us um, at the time um, and was a kind of a big event in shaping the politics in that region as well. Um, most of us at that time were also quite heavily involved in um, what became the Treatment Action Campaign, um, which is the lobbying group for antiretrovirals in South Africa. Um, I was involved in uh, the Head of Communications for the Pathways of Women's Empowerment, which was a DFID funded research, feminist research consortium um, for five years. And during that time, there were some very interesting kind of tensions um, between the focus on sexuality and gender, um, which are for most of us who work in this field, uh, kind of an ongoing tension in a way. And during the kind of um, first decade of the 2000s as well, there was quite a lot of activity at IDS, starting with Susie Jolly and Jill Clates's Queering Development Seminars when they were doing their MA in 2000. And then uh, Masculinities Conference and um, a kind of seminar on heteronormativity um, etc that that many of us were involved in as well that kind of shaped my thinking around it um but it was quite peripheral um and then i was involved in a in a differed funded um sexuality and law research project um during which i wrote a paper with some university colleagues on hate crimes in south africa and um in looking at 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 that Kind of area and could I have the next slide please 
um, I kind of kept coming across Zanelli Mkholi's work. Um, for those of you who don't know their work already, um, Zanelli is a very well-established um, queer photographer who uh, set up a collective called Inkaniso and has been really influential in um, the South African kind of queer space and, and very active in development circles and academic circles and activist circles initially. And I was really fascinated by the way they kind of moved um, across through kind of activists and into art spaces. And at the time, um, the idea of queer visual activism was primarily associated with Moholi, um, but in in a kind of American and European context was being taken up um, in reference to protest movements, particularly Occupy and um, the protest movements of the squares, um, the Arab Spring, etc. And so I was very interested with this disjuncture between um, the way that South African um, queer visual activism was being kind of articulated within a fine art space. Um, and I felt that the way in which the images were being discussed rather than the politics around them was missing a whole lot um, at, of, of, of what was political about them. Um, and next slide, please. And in fact, if you could skip to the next one after that. So um, I am um, back one. Thanks a lot. Um, I started um, a PhD at the University of Brighton, um, looking at queer vigil activism within the South African context um, and came across a number of quite extraordinary artists and activists. This is uh, Faka, um, and they are working in kind of clubbing spaces. They were curating an online platform and they were really um, engaged in the kind of collective development of queer political subjectivities. Um, and at the time, I mean, this doesn't feel like mainstream development work, right? This is very much kind of cultural studies um, or media. Um, but with the kind of shrinking of, of civic space and the increasing um, importance of the culture space as a, as a vital political space in a sense, um, a lot of this work has become more mainstream um, next slide, please. This is Ati Patraruga, who um, it kind of regards his work very much as a, a decolonizing um, activity within culture spaces, high, high art spaces. Um, and this is part of his Queens in Exile um, video piece. And next slide, please. Um, this is Robert Hamlin's work, um, and Robert was very involved with SWEAT, which is the um, Sex Works Education and Advocacy Task Force, and set up a kind of exploratory photography project with Sistershood, who were um, who are a group of um, trans female trans sex workers in Cape Town, and they. Um, this is Lee Davids, who um, died in 2019, February 2019. But for um, five years or so, Robert and Lee were kind of collaborators on quite an extraordinary project that became uh, Intersections that was looking at um, their own kind of identity as trans folk and how that interpolated very differently in terms of race and in terms of class within the South African context. Uh, next slide, please. And this is Dean Hutton, who was a photographer at the Mail and Guardian, which is the weekly national paper in South Africa, um, and was studying fine art at Michaelis um, during the initial Fees Must Fall protests um, and got involved um, in protesting through this art piece, which was a kind of performance piece that occupied various um, spaces and um, some lectures um, at the University of Cape Town called Fuck White People um, and then was exhibited in the National Gallery and the Cape Party kind of came in and defaced it and there was a big kind of political furore about that. Um, and 
so what what I what I found very interesting um, about much of this work is the way the queerness kind of spilled into um, other issues of of decolonization and other kind of social issues around around race and around class um, and around the kind of problematic social hierarchies um, that we find ourselves trapped in. Uh, next slide, please. And so I was thinking about. Um, what queering development is, and perhaps I should say a little bit more about about what queer is to me. And I, I quite like the um, Gammon and Isgro three uses of queer, which is first as as homosexual, second as a shortcut for the laundry list of marginalized sexual desires, third as a kind of anti normative positionality, and then fourth and fifth. I think the uses that I've kind of more recently arrived at are. Um, as a verb to challenge or disrupt normative understandings or ways of being, but also um, fifthly as a non-binary worldview, um, which connects to the notion of heteronormativity, which prescribes certain ways of being, certain damaging ways and limiting ways, a kind of gender restrictive ways of being a man or being a woman. Um, and um, I was thinking, what, how, how do we queer development at a, at a kind of very broad level um, the, there seem to be at least two versions of development, right? One which is a very kind of top-down blueprint, um, kind of um, telling, not listening version, um, which I would say is anachronistic and um, that we need to focus on supporting progressive social movements um, and rights work and my activism. Um, I know Andy Searle and very many other people have done some work on using queer as an audit or inclusivity lens um, to, I personally often have it as a kind of analytical anti-binary reflex or tool. Um, is it that simple? It's either this or that? No, probably it isn't. Um, and thirdly, increasingly um, because of backlash politics, um, I think queerness becomes really important as a worldview against one that is gender restrictive. Um, and final slide. I think I'm out of time. Um, this is the effigy of, of Judith Butler that was burned in, in Brazil during her um, book tour where she was kind of seen as the high priestess of, of gender ideology. Um, and a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment is, is, is kind of thinking about how, how one crafts uh, yeah, a kind of discursive queer worldview against the current um, anti-gender movements of the right. And I think I'm out of time. I hope some of that was coherent. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much, Tessa. Um, so we'll move on uh, to our next speaker, um, which is Joel. Yeah, and this is Joel's um, presentation here. Welcome, Joel. Well, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pride Nigeria. So I was part of a collective that made this happen over the course of one month. And it's the first of many um, acts of civil disobedience and defiance. So next slide, please. Uh, welcome to Lagos, Nigeria. And this is where it was all about back to basics um, for even myself as a queer or you know, LGBT identifying individual, um, learning about paying homage to pride where they came from, the colors, people who made these things happen, the year and all of that. And behind me is the National Theater, Igomu, and why here it's difficult to separate, you know, um, LGBT people and the arts. It's a bit, you know, um, stereotypical, but it's true. But however, LGBT people can be, you know, found across different, you know, um, industries and facets of life. Um, and also you can see in the background Queen Amina and her steed. Um, and we drew strength from her because she was a fierce, you know, he heroine. Um, and that is Lagos Apapa, um, Nigeria. And obviously the details in the description. Next slide, please. Um, and still in Lagos, we visited and went, we carried on a you know, crusade to the Arumeta, the three wise men. And if you think about Lagos, you 
think about the National Theatre, you think about the Three Wise Men, although the location has been moved, but when you're coming into Lagos um, from previous years, um, you would be welcomed by these men. And it's especially significant because they are welcoming anyone into coming into Lagos. But obviously for queer people, it's not the case. We are, you know, really not welcomed anywhere in Nigeria and you can even argue in Africa. Um, but why here? Um, the Yoruba's belief in, you know, the supremacy of the right hand over the left and in Yoruba culture, the right hand signifies acceptance and respect. And that is some of the founding, you know, um, basics of pride and human rights and, you know, all of these things. Um, the description as well in, you know, so next slide, please. Um, here was especially um, exciting for all of us. Um, so this is the Fellow Liberation Statue, Constellation Liberation, and it pays homage to the man, the myth, the legend, that is Fellow Anikula Bukuti. Um, although he was way before my time, but I took time to, you know, go and study who this person was and what, you know, his work still stands for till this day. And it's kind of like spoke to us and we embodied Fela's spirit of activism and Pan-Africanism. And it kind of like even pushed us further to know that freedom is never given, it must be earned. Um, all of these have video footage of what we, you know, did there, but we chose pictures. Um, so next slide, please. From Ibute, welcome still, Lagos. Um, the, these, you know, canos, the standing canos, they represent, um, the lifestyle and waterways and the coastline of Lagos. But when we talk about, um, indigenous life and culture, the LGBT people are often sidelined. It's a culture of, um, silence and invincibility, and we are taking up space and rewriting the narrative. Um, so next slide. Um, Cathedral Church of Christ, um, Marina, I think, Lagos, the Anglican ca Cathedral is the oldest cathedral in the Church of Nigeria, and it is impossible, quite frankly, to mention LGBT struggles without religious influence, and um, we discussed here existing in the face of adversity, and we thrive in, even when in, you know, unwelcoming spaces um, were hunted, um, ostracized, and, you know, even more. Um, murdered. So we're, we're making statements across Lagos. Next slide, please. Um, the Tafawa Palewa Square, otherwise known as TBS. Um, this was where the, um, we got our independence, the celebration of Nigerians independence. And obviously then the LGBT community was not even, you know, in the mix. And even to this day, we're still not you know, um, considered citizens, uh, as we strive for second class citizens. Um, but the four horses and seven radicals represent strength and dignity, and this is pride, you know. And we want, we are demanding our rainbow democracy and independence and all of, you know, of that. So next slide, please. Um, Broad Streets, um, Lagos. This is one of the busiest streets in Lagos, and it's the commercial hub in one of the central business districts of the Lagos Island. And in this place, we discuss trans, trans rights, our trans sisters, two spirit people, past and present day, and we're waving our flags across Nigeria. You know, um, and at this time we were in Lagos for a pride that started in Abuja, but we'll get to that in moment so we were painting Lagos the bright colors as we shoot so this is pride next slide please the echo tag lost to mural the graffiti is a platform that focuses on revisiting the great moments of Lagos and we're making a grand entrance um the LGBT community uninvited um but however we exist um, so the highway is our runway because this is another very busy road, the Ozumbam Badiway um, road. When you think about Lagos Island, it's impossible to ignore Ozumbam Badiway because, you know, it leads into the Lekki Toll Gates where you get into, you know, island proper, the Lekki areas. So next slide, please. 
Um, but that mainland bridge, this was especially um, emotional for all of us, but I had to speak on the pitfalls of depression and mental health and the high suicidal rates within the LGBT community. And it's a known fact that everyone really, most people take their life here in the third mainland, you know, free jumping into the open sea and LGBT youths especially take their lives here when it becomes too much. So we're a community in dire need of resources and, you know, um, a home, a safe haven in what's supposed to be our home. But, you know, when the home is a mouth of a shark, what do you do? So a culture of silence, again, reigns supreme, but we're changing the narrative, a paradigm shifts, slowly but surely. This is pride. Next slide, please. The Lekki Kui Link Bridge, again, this was where the first ever run was made, the pride run. Um, we ran across the bridge with waving flags and all of that. And um, we did start off introducing the various gender identities and, you know, sexual orientations. I think as of now, there are over 100, which is a good thing. People are defining their selves and, you know, how they feel. Um, and the bridge is especially special, not just because it connects, you know, the lucky Ikoi axis, but at night it turns into a true wonder. It glows into the bright colors um, in those beams, all four of them, they change into the bright colors. So it's an LGBT bridge, um, you know, as opposed to the third mainland, which is one, the longest of three bridges connecting the mainland and the island. This is another very famous um, bridge in Lagos, Nigeria, and all of Nigeria, to be honest, a lot of people know the Lekki Koi Link Bridge. Next slide, please. And welcome to Abuja. And behind me, you can see the, the National Mosque, Abuja. Um, here we um, went to say hello to our brothers and sisters of faith in the Muslim community, but we were also identifying hypocrisy across, you know, religious doctrines. Um, it was um, us discussing, again, you know, democracy and what it means, because as of this time, I think it was a day to the 1st of October, um, which is Nigeria's, you know, independence or democracy, you know, day and all of that, um, with religious, you know, um, beliefs, we are between two worlds, we are caught between two worlds, the, you know, Muslim faith and the Christian faith, and we neither accepts us, so it's kind of like this very, conundrum and dichotomy of how do we, you know, exist in a very highly religious um, nation and love is amazing, a time where we dare to love. Next slide, please. And welcome to the National Assembly, the Senate, um, where the law was made criminalizing LGBT unions, otherwise known as the SSMPA, Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. Um, behind me, you can see there are guards and all of that there. And behind me is the entrance into the Senate. Um, if you squint, you'd see. Um, we went in waving our flags and we went all the way into the Senate, preaching love and how the law should be repealed. Um, so yeah, we're ch challenging the status quo and writing history. Next slide, please. Um, the city gate, Abuja's famous city gate, it welcomes anyone coming into, well, supposedly it's supposed to welcome anyone coming into Abuja, but that's not the case. You know, um, murder is an everyday occurrence and heavily um, underreported, not only in big cities, but across Nigeria and the African diaspora. Sadly, it's still a menace on the global scene. Um, all of this could have, can and very well could be very, um, can be avoided um, if, you know, the right structures are put in place. But I, we understand that progress is painfully slow, but we pride on. Next slide, please. And we reset the Catholic Church, the Holy Trinity, um, revisiting it again, religion and the role of Catholic Church in criminalizing LGBT unions and our right to love. This is pride. And all as we went, we kept on in introducing and educating ourselves and hopefully other people about the various, you know, gender identities and sexual orientations and all of that. Even I now identify and always have been, but just embrace the fact that I am a two spirit person. Next slide, please. And this is inside the Senate. You could see behind me, there's the number four. 
um, this was taken from the, the picture was taken from a video. That's why it looks blurred. And this is the National Assembly, a playground for a pride protest, as it should. Um, this is where we ended the pride, the month long pride protest on the 1st of October. And I gave a speech from my heart um, here. So in the spirit of all the brave LGBT heroes and heroines, we took on the most feared location and we won. Granted, we became, you know, targets, you know, people of interest, but um, it was also Black History Month. And, you know, um, we also talked about that and LGBT movement, as well as discussing the repeal of the SSMPA. Next slide, please. And again, the timeline, um, that's the third mainland bridge behind me. Um, it's the longest of three, you know, bridges um, connecting the mainland into the island of Lagos. So first of September 2019, Pride kicks off in Abuja and obviously there were interstate travels, traveling with allies between both cities. And on the 1st of October 2019, Pride ends at the National Assembly Abuja. Next slide, please. Thank you. We are one family. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Joe, for taking us uh, on that journey uh, through Nigeria and through this uh, amazing photographs um, in various locations. Um, our next speaker I'm going to pass the floor to is uh, Rajesh um, Srinivas. Yeah. So again, uh, good evening uh, from India. So my name is Rajesh Umadevi Srinivas. I identify myself as a bisexual uh, queer man. So I represent uh, Sangama, which is a working class organization, which has been working for the rights of working class, sexual and gender minorities, sex workers, and people living with HIV since 1999. I think when we think of sexuality or when we think of queer rights, we really need to focus on broader framework of human rights and social justice. Uh, what I want to focus really today is again Sangama's experiment and and the issues which have been worked in alliance with other movements. I think it's important uh, to understand like when we fight for a struggle. So I think across uh, South Asia, many countries in terms of uh, when you have anti-sodomy laws, when you look at the history of uh, a queer organizing in India has been primarily in terms of uh, looking at uh, through the form of law to look at uh, repealing laws, which is basically which criminalizes uh, same-sex acts. So in 2018, we had one of the most historic judgment and now Tate Singh Johar judgment, which in a way read down section 377, which decriminalized same-sex acts. I think that judgment was profound in itself because one of the judges said, and I quote, history owes an apology uh, to, mem to the LGBTI community and its uh, family members. And I think the judgment uh, will be a great disservice if we only limit it to anti-sodomy legislations because what it added at its core is looking at a new imagination of transformative constitutionalism to look at constitutional mor morality and just not look at laws, legislations from the sphere of majoritarian view and also take into all uh, communities into that. So that was the biggest kind of a uh, struggle. And today we are in post uh, now Tate Singh, uh, Joa Judgment Day's friends. But the issue really is just not about criminalizing same-sex acts. The issue for working class sexual and gender minorities have always been about a shelter it's about food, it's about access to public spaces. It's about looking at fighting in terms of torture, uh, looking at uh, in terms of fake cases and one of the things. So in terms of the organizing, I can talk in terms of uh, my own experience and also the experience of Sangama and many other groups in India have been is to work in alliance with uh, other uh, movements, other broad-based uh, social justice movements. To give you an example, when there's a huge uh, kind of movement which kind of came on against anti-dams, where the Narmada uh, Bachao Andolan was there. So we were there in solidarity with that movement. And just uh, just a couple of years ago, just before COVID-19 pandemic, we saw discriminatory kind of citizenship laws because there was I think the state wanted to amend the citizenship, right? So to put it in simplistic kind of explanation, we need to prove our citizenship. So against that and against the National Registrar of Citizenship, there was a huge movement which kind of came out and queer people were in solidarity with that. And just to give you an example, in Assam in the year 2019, when the National Registrar of Citizenship, 2000 transgender people were left out at it because you had to prove your documents 
to say that, look, we are citizens of this country. Imagine in terms of the fascist tendencies of the state in terms of where we are kind of uh, going towards. Then in terms of our alliances, in terms of work, working very closely with trade unions, with workers' struggles, because we also need to see ourselves as citizens in terms of workers' struggles, in terms of today we are at a time where many labor laws in this country have been uh, kind of in terms of merged for the so-called ease of businesses. So we have kind of relook at many labor laws and what is that going to really do with that? Then in terms of our intersection with working with sex workers because Sangama works very closely with sex workers and we look at sex work to the construct of work to the construct of labor thereby saying that sex workers uh, kind of provide sexual services in exchange of money so in India the the queer community and the sex worker rights have kind of gone and in that and so has the feminist movement I think it's important to kind of acknowledge the tremendous contribution of the feminist movement in India uh, towards the issue of queer struggles. So at the intersection of our work has always been at the intersection of class, caste in India, looking at gender and ability. It reminds me of the quote of Audrey Lord, who said there's nothing called as a single issue struggle because we do not lead a single issue lives. So our work has always been at the intersection of multiple identities and at the same time parallelly working with other movements other and being in solidarity with other uh, causes to look at the broader kind of uh, uh, social justice. Even as I speak in at least in India and Karnataka uh, since the BJP government which is again a government which is right-wing fundamentalist kind of the old issue of hijab has come into the forefront and from the city I speak. So we were in solidarity because hijab is also it's an issue about choice. Then how do you look at really about choice in terms of these tendencies of Islamophobia? We've also been part in India where there's also a backlash for the constitution of this country. So there's been a movement of save the constitution because that also becomes an important thing because most of the marginalized communities, I think we should thank the constitution of India because that it is because of our constitution which we have kind of traveled so far because that document kind of gives us uh, issues on justice, equality, dignity, in terms of how do we kind of uh, see. So that is where it's been in terms of our queer organizing. So I want, I know, and I think the other important thing, what we really need to reflect upon is in terms of the challenges of what we see, it's just not outside, but within uh, queer organizing, within LGBTI organizing, you also see now an increase in terms of right-wing Hindu majoritarianism, which has been coming in, you see homo nationalism again. I'm borrowing this term by the South African academician because, in terms of, so the question really is: Does Kashmiri queer lives, people living in Kashmir, uh, queer people living in Kashmir, really matter? Or the same as in terms of northeastern parts of India, where where they have legislations like the Armed Forces Special Pass Act, which give our, which gives arbitrary powers to the military, for example, and there's been a huge campaign uh, for the last couple of decades to repeal the Armed Forces Special Pass Act. So what are the issues about that? Or, for example, the issues about Palestinian queer people and how do we kind of look at when you have increasingly, when you have states kind of furthering the LGBTI issue to further the nationalistic cause and a nationalistic agenda. What about self-determination struggles across? Because I believe at the core of queer politics, at the core of queer politics is also about to stand in solidarity and also to fight for all kinds of struggles, to all kinds of oppressive struggles. So self-determination, just not self-determination, just not for identity, for example, but self-determination for homeland. You know, many parts in the globe, many people are kind of fighting for the self-determination struggle. So against occupation, for example, against anti-war, for example, uh, today as we speak, you know, the kind of what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, for example, in terms of things. So I think it's important to kind of, because I think we need to have a newer imagination. I think we need to look at the newer imagination, the form of politics, which we really look at it. And for me, at the core of any politics, we need to have a politics of love, politics of care, 
and politics of compassion, which is also being driven by our kind of, by the experiences, by our lived experience. And how do we look at that to kind of bring in a larger kind of rainbow alliances where we work with everyone to further the cause of LGBTI people at the same time to really look at broader uh, social justice, to look at issues on dignity and to look at issues around, around uh, freedom. And I think my 10 minutes is done here. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajesh, for uh, speaking. Um, lots of really interesting points and also uh, many synergies with uh, what our speakers uh, spoke, uh, speakers prior to you spoke about. Um, for our audience members, just wanted to remind you that you can you know please go ahead and add your questions to the uh, question and answer button you can uh, add your questions now matthew our next speaker is going to speak and after that we're going to turn to question and answer so um, whatever questions you may have just put them in there and then we'll, we'll go directly to them uh, right after matthew is done so matthew um i'll hand over to you now okay it's great to be here with everybody and um, thanks a lot to all the previous speakers and to the the organizers of the event um uh, I have to tell you, uh, everything's going on at the moment for me. Um, strikes, snow in Glasgow and uh, computer failure. So um, this, this talk is going to be quite uh, straightforward, um, which is probably not the, the word to use for a queer event. But um, what I'm going to do is talk to you about a project that I was involved in uh, called Strong in Diversity, Bold on Inclusion which was a UK government uh, funded international development project. Um, so I want to use this occasion as an opportunity just to, to let people know really that this uh, project, um, at least a, a certain phase of it happened and to enable you to, to reflect on it and, and perhaps ask me questions and um, engage in a conversation. So, um, I was part of this international development project focused on LGBT inclusion, which was really the first uh, project that the UK government had funded. Um, so this was through the Department for International Development as part of its UK Aid Connect program and the uh, DFID has now been merged, as we know, into the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and I should say that the UK Aid Connect programme, I think, was conceived under Theresa May's uh, government um, and then um, towards the end came under Boris Johnson's uh, government. Um, so the project uh, was a consortium project um, with a number of different organisations involved and the project was initially assigned 12 million pounds, although, uh, as I'll explain, uh, only a small fraction of that was, uh, was actually um, spent. Um, so, uh, like other UK Aid Connect projects um, in the, the DFID UK Aid Connect uh, programme, which had a number of uh, projects, I think more than 10, um, our project had two phases. One was a co-creation phase, which was initially planned to be nine months, uh, which would have been followed by the main phase to actually deliver the project. So the first phase is to design the project and then the second phase to deliver it. And uh, the second phase would have been three years and three months to make four years in total. Now, what happened uh, in practice was that as the co-creation phase proceeded, um, various events, including Brexit, uh, COVID-19, and also UK government cuts to international aid funding um, took place. And so in that context, um, after phase one, phase two was not funded. Um, so there were several extensions of the project, uh, which eventually meant the co-creation phase went on for 16 months um, instead of the, the originally planned nine. 
And uh, so the main phase, if it had gone ahead, would have been reduced to two years and eight months. And obviously, at the end of the co-creation phase, partners were having to redesign all the project activities to fit within the shortened time scale of the uh, pr proposed uh, length of time for the for the main phase. Um, so, the uh, the eventual decision of the UK government was not to fund the main phase. Um, which was um, expressed particularly in terms of um, concerns about the level of risk in the context of COVID-19 and the uh, economic effects of COVID-19 uh, and uh, the UK government's approach to, to risk judgments in uh, funding international development in that context. Um, so the aim of the project was to promote LGBT inclusion, uh, especially in Africa, and um, this was uh, articulated with sustainable development goals. The project proposed to work in uh, five major cities in five countries in Africa. Um, so it had quite a, an innovative focus on cities and uh, it, the intention was to work with existing LGBT, sorry, LGBT NGOs and partners uh, in those cities. So the five uh, sites were Nairobi in Kenya, Dakar in Senegal, Lagos in Nigeria, Maputo in Mozambique, and Lusaka in uh, Zambia. And I just wanted to mention uh, in relation to my own uh, positioning, I'm, I would describe myself as an international political sociologist based in sociology at University of Glasgow. Uh, so I'm, uh, I've always had an interest in development, but I'm not centrally a, a sort of development uh, person. I think that's important to mention. Um, so, the consortium that I was part of, which, which bid for the project, included 10 organisations. Uh, the leading organisation was the development NGO EVOS, which is centrally based in the Netherlands, um, though with regional offices in Africa and in other continents. Um, so this was quite unusual in itself, that the lead partner being funded by the British government was based in the Netherlands rather than in the UK. And um, other uh, consortiums uh, bid, bid for this uh, as well. Um, so the other partner organisations were pat particularly two major African transnational NGOs working on LGBT rights, so Coalition of African Lesbians, uh, sometimes uh, known by the acronym CAL, uh, which has a focus on women, and African Men for Sexual Health and Rights, uh, often known as AMSHA, which has more of a focus on men. So these are, are two uh, networks that work transnationally uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, really. Um, Kaleidoscope Trust was another uh, partner organisation, which is a UK-based uh, organisation that works for LGBTI uh, plus uh, human rights uh, and equality uh, based in London. Uh, Article 19, which is an NGO that has a particular focus on media and um, challenging uh, censorship, for example. Uh, Synergia, which is a small NGO that works transnationally to facilitate funding to LGBT uh, groups in the global south. And Workplace Pride, which is an organisation based in the Netherlands in Amsterdam that works on uh, LGBT rights uh, in business and workplaces. And uh, finally, the research element of the project was led from the University of London, uh, specifically the School of Advanced Study, where it was led by 
Corinne Lennox in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, uh, from which uh, several Africa-based researchers became employed. Uh, for example, uh, Larissa Kajue, uh, who was working on Senegal, who was absolutely fantastic. And um, uh, similarly, uh, uh, other African researchers um, uh, based in, in each of the other cities. Um, so in addition to University of London, there were two other universities involved. Uh, and we were um, sort of funded via the University of London. Um, and we were sort of conceived in a role as partners of the, of the core partners. Um, but generally we were regarded as, as partners within the project. Um, so University of Pretoria's uh, Centre for Human Rights was uh, played an important role uh, with work led by Professor Franz Villun, uh, who is a leading expert on human rights and LGBT human rights in Africa, uh, with colleagues there, including Ayo Sugunro from Nigeria. And also myself, based at University of Glasgow, and my post was funded to work only uh, one day a week. Um, and my role in the research team, um, one of my central roles was to lead a literature review across the five uh, countries. And, um, but I also participated in all the project meetings and various working groups and, and a number of different activities and uh, designing the, the research element. Um, so I'm very limited in what I can say about um, what happened within the project um, because uh, of the contract signed and the communication policy agreed among all the partners. Um, but what I can uh, say is that the, the projects, um, I think one of, one of the elements that led to us being successful in the bid was having a, a clear theory of change. And the theory of change involved the African transnational networks working with um, local LGBT groups in each of the five cities um, to develop work where they would engage with what we called societal leaders. But societal leaders had a very broad meaning. So it didn't necessarily mean uh, politicians. It could mean um, religious leaders. It could mean um, social media influencers on YouTube. Um, so generally the, the methodology of the project would have focused on um, LGBT groups already in the cities working with um, partners in the project to, um, to engage and influence um, opinions about uh, LGBT issues among various social actors in, in these um, states. So um, I'm conscious of, of time and it's difficult to, to draw my thoughts together. So I have to draw to a close. Um, what I, my, my comment would be that I think the, the co-creation phase of, of the project shows the sort of distinctive scope for partners to work together. And I do think that seemed a very creative um, process. So I would sort of draw attention to that as very important in thinking about how groups work together. Um, I would also say, I generally had a, a very good impression of the civil servant uh, contact um, for the project at DFID, um, Mike Batcock, who was generally very supportive and very hands-off. Um, and so I think we, when we think about the state's role in international development, we need to distinguish between what the civil servants are thinking and doing and what the politicians are doing and the, the role of the UK government. Um, and finally, I'll just say clearly that the withdrawal of funding um, is extremely problematic for uh, thinking about international aid. Um, but I don't think we should assume that there wouldn't be further uh, even uh, conservative government moves to fund international aid in the, in the future. I think we should, uh, that sort of remains an open question. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, um, for that. Um, we have um, a couple of questions here, and I also have some questions. Um, so these are quite broad questions that uh, I guess any panelist can can uh, address this. So um, I will. Yes. Yeah, so I'll ask the first question that was asked here. It is uh, how can we overcome the powerful challenges to queer international development by global conservative? Uh, uh, fundamentalist religious institution and cultural influences. And actually I'll piggyback that and I'll add um, my you know, question to this because it's related um, on, because I think it was Rajesh and uh, Tessa who spoke uh, quite, uh, who at least mentioned sort of the right-wing um, political movements, right-wing governments and uh, the backlash to sort of the anti-gender movement. So um, according, so the, the question here is directed to any speaker. So, what, what, uh, what is the, how can queer activism or queer international development um, push back against the challenges posed by um, both right wing political movements and also conservative religious institutions and cultural influences? Yeah, go ahead, Tessa. Um, I have some ideas, um, partly from asking a lot of um, fellow activists this question and partly by thinking about it a lot. I, I mean, I think I think there is something really important about um, broadening this beyond sexual minorities um, and because the harm that is is done by heteronormativity is 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 kind of global and it, to my mind is kind of a driver of gender based violence more broadly. Um, so as, as, as a feminist, I think it's the, the kind of engaging with um, the heteronormative kind of analysis is very important. Um, in terms of kind of countering the, the right in a sense, I mean, that's a million dollar question, obviously, but I know that there's some very interesting work going on with the other foundation in South Africa, for example, who are working with progressive non-homophobic religious leaders at a community level. Um, I know um, from Paul Miam Tetwa, who is with uh, Just Associates in Johannesburg, um, her view, view is that, that we have to um, knock on the doors of, you know, go door to door, basically, and work at a very local level and, and talk to people. And many of the artists I work with um, feel similarly that, that when, when people know you and you're part of those communities, then 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 you are changing those hearts and minds i mean obviously that's a the, the i think there have to be multiple kind of multi-pronged multi-level strategies um yeah exactly so people. yeah sure uh, I'll, uh, i know that matthew kind of has to leave a little bit earlier and uh, ask him um, whether he had any reactions to that question concerning uh, overcoming the challenges to um, from global conservative forces but also like you mentioned at the end of uh, your talk i mean sort of the withdrawal of funding for instance in international aid and uh, the conservative government of the uk what, what are the how do we overcome these challenges uh, what could be some strategies it's a huge question <laughs> and um, honestly at this moment I don't feel I have a, a brilliant uh, kind of insightful uh, response to that um, I maybe would have something to say about the, the next question I think the same attendee has asked um, if we move on to that sure yeah um, the question concerning the generational struggles so yeah, um, th so there's a question about does uh, does opposition come from older generations around the world who've been inculcated with different values from younger generations? How feasible is it for this disparity to be chiefly addressed by including queer studies in, in schools and universities? So what I would want to say is I, th I think um, queer studies is all good, right? I mean, I'm, I'm all, I teach queer studies of, and as part of the mix of gender and sexuality and um, and decolonizing as well. I'm very trying to engage with decolonizing uh, agendas. But I think what I feel is that there is a specific lack of capacity in the academic world around international development and queer development. 
and um, Tessa's comments about the, the great work that happened at IDS with Susie Jolly and, um, and others there. I, I really agree that that was a, a very much a sort of flowering of um, great work, but there hasn't been enough um, of people following it through. And in a way, the, the way that um, Corinne Lennox and I were approached to be involved, I mean, with, with the other consortiums that bid um, for the funding that we, that we got, um, I don't think they were involving, um, or certainly one of them, I don't, I don't think was involving people from universities. Um, and I think the universities in my experience did play a really positive role, uh, including in informing things like sort of practices with data collection, research, you know, um, so not only for the research element, but also we, we informed um, practices for thinking about using data and monitoring within the, the main project. Um, so I think generally the universities can really beneficially get involved, um, but they're, you, you know, neither Corinne Lennox or myself, or indeed Franz Villian in uh, Pretoria were at core sort of focused on development. You know, uh, you could say that we, re we had expertise in politics, sociology, law, queer studies, lots of relevant things, but um, so, so generally I would, I would just point to the, the value of this workshop for focusing on um, queering development and the, the need to expand work in that space. Point taken. Okay, so yeah, I understand that the kind of continuing to have these kinds of discussions and bringing together people from different um, sectors and their involvements and also um, continuing to talk about this. Um, and yeah, I understand Matthew might have to leave us early, but um, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And I will um, just ask, uh, you know, on regarding both these questions, because both of them are quite broad, but um, Joel um, and, and Rajesh, you also spoke. Um, I mean, I think, Joel, your presentation, you talked a little bit about sort of religious uh, institutions and uh, kind of your photographs in front of the churches and, and the mosques. Um, do you have any sort of comments on sort of what could be ways to build um, solidarities or to overcome uh, challenges um, that is posed by um, sort of conservative fundamentalist religious institutions um, in your experience? Yeah, I think it's, it's a conundrum. It's quite, you know, it's quite dichotomy and trichotomy of different, you know, but I'd say um, from my perspective, um, queer development or international development, it's been mostly grassroots, bottom to top. I, I know in the media and, you know, the news, I mean, I'm, I've been to the UN a, a number of times, it's all good and all well, but when it comes to implementation and actually doing the work, it's it's missing, you know, it's, it's more talk, less action. But, um, if world leaders can, you know, um, really come together and put their foot down um, and say, you know what, in this region, we focus on this, um, you know, um, development in queer culture or, you know, um, human rights and pay visits to those countries and have these long discussions and all of that. Um, I think that would go, you know, a long way and also involve obviously the grassroots you know organizations doing the work and you know we can come to a conclusion or meet in the middle halfway into because obviously progress and development it really does take you know it, it's slow um otherwise i would say bank on time um you know it, it's supposed to get better with time but even that statement is quite you know dangerous because Nigeria, for instance, for, for instance, I've been, you know, born and raised there. Um, it, it, religion and all of that, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. You know, it's been passed down. So I think um, we just have to look for a strategy that, you know, will work. We try, fail and fail forward. Um, but it's really quite, you know, it's 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 a difficult thing um you know I, I did 
by the virtue of my nonprofit to our schools in Nigeria. And there's nothing, you know, there's no mention of, you know, um, human rights, talk more of, you know, LGBT rights and, you know, all that. Um, and I do see students who are perceived to be, you know, queer and, you know, the bullying that they face, kind of like it's a cycle. So I'm like, how do we, you know, do this? Hence, you know, the force behind, you know what, I'm coming out, my friends, my allies, this is what, you know, we have to do. Um, it's intentional. So I, I added my voice and, you know, with my allies, we did what we could and still doing. Um, so from an individual perspective, I'll say, yeah, it's still effective to advocate and do all of that, but it's slow. So if we can partner, you know, with bodies that are strong, you know, um, and world leaders that have power, nations and all of that, to do this, I think it's just the, a surefire way because the religious bodies, especially again in Africa, they're quite strong and quite adamant and ruthless, to be honest. So, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that was, you know, the answer for this book. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Uh, Matthew, you want to just say something? Yeah, yeah just um, very briefly. I'm, I'm going to have to go after this, unfortunately, because I have to go and teach. But um, um, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with what was uh, just just said about the, the, you know, the most valuable work is already happening at grassroots, right? So the, the question of how um, international aid funding is a kind of another question and um but on that question i mean a key issue is would be how to get money to grassroots right how how to get money from uh the british government if they are willing to fund and, and if people want that money to to grassroots now i think a key issue that people working on queer international development especially in the uk could focus on would be the kind of financial governmentality of um, that that is used by FCDO, um, because basically um, a key issue is is what they're looking for is is various accounting practices in NGO partners um, and a kind of monitoring of what happens to the money. And particularly in our kind of project, I think the, the idea was that money would perhaps go to the African partners, but then um, perhaps be um, uh, subdivided to, to other um, national or subnational organizations. And I think this was, you'll not be surprised, a, 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 sort of a point of contention sometimes in within the project in terms of how this would work. And I think, um, some of the part the African partner organizations were perhaps not expecting the forms of um, financial governmentality that, that DFID was trying to impose and perhaps might have regarded some of that as coming from the lead partner EVOS when perhaps EVOS was just telling them what, what DFID was requiring. So this creates all kinds of tensions. So, I mean, a key, um, kind of, I think that this is a key site for engagement, but basically is, is all I can say. And uh, I'm really, really sorry, but I, I have to leave to be able to go and teach. Uh, all my students will not be happy. So I'll leave you with that thought. And um, I hope pe people feel welcome to be in touch by email. Uh, and also you might wish to contact Corinne Lennox at uh, School of Advanced Study, who, who led the research element of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thanks for that. Um, I think uh, actually Matthew left us with like quite an interesting sort of uh, point of discussion, which um, maybe came up a bit um, in, in what the speaker said, but, but sort of this relationship between the global north, um, sort of the aid industry and this um, financial governmentality, as he had mentioned, and, and the kinds of tensions and pressures that can put on organizations working at the grassroots or working in the global south. Um, and yeah, I was actually wondering if um, maybe Rajesh can um, talk a little bit about that because I know that your uh, Sangama has partnered with uh, um, you know organizations in the global north and sort of what kinds of tensions uh, does that bring up? I think, I think um, international aid 
and what brings in, I think, the politics of it, right? Because I think there are two things. One, you have international donor agencies, then you also have international foundations, international LGBT foundations, in terms of that, what we kind of fund grassroots issue. But, but you know, but the problem has always been, but Global North tends to dictate the global discourse around queer politics. And it's just not within the sphere of international aid politics, but it's also within the sphere of larger international uh, global LGBTI networks and in terms of representation and issues around that. Because one of the issues, if you kind of look at the entire queer organizing or queer movement, I think the global north, you have kind of a singular trajectory. One is looking at decriminalization, then you go towards same-sex marriage, and then you go towards rights, right? That it's been a singular trajectory in terms of that. But in the global south, there's also been multiplicity of other issues. Issues on housing, issues on employment, issues on access to health care, for example, especially for people living with HIV, uh, access to antiretroviral therapy medicines and all of that. But yeah, because the global not had this singular kind of trajectory in terms of where the movement has to be headed, so you also have this conflict within global south where the groups are now in India because of the reading down of Section 377, now you're going towards same-sex marriage. I'm not questioning uh, the, the construct of marriage, nor am I really questioning that, yes, same-sex marriage rights are important, but at the same time, what are the issues which we are fighting out? And right now, the issues has also been, when, at least in India, where we're clearly seeing where the constitution itself is at stake, a democracy is at stake in terms of how do you look at the dailiness of life on issues from because the, the pandemic has thrown out these issues. What about issues about food security, for example, employment? And how do we really look at look at ourselves as just not as as queer people, but also as citizens of this country? And in India, do we really have an institutional articulation of rights and in terms of benefits? But but these are these issues. But what tends to get foregrounded is because, see, and also it becomes very difficult, uh, for example, for organizations in the global south, especially for grassroots organizations to also negotiate this because it's about power, right? It's also about, because it's also about funding. And because when you really don't have access to funding, at times groups then do take that money and then try to, within the limitations, then try to kind of work out of uh, different ways. So that is one thing. I think the other thing is I just need to, want to kind of go back for a minute with the question of religion. I think in religion in India, you have groups kind of working with us. I think one of the challenges has been, the limitations has been, I think we activists or people in the movements never really engaged with the institutions of religion because we always saw that as, you know, there's not been that kind of engagement because we also come in from this very old, as, as self-identified atheists and other things. But then we realize that for many people, religion becomes a very important kind of institution in their lives. So today in India, you I think oneness within the institution of religion, you have a kind of a process which has begun. You have people kind of coming in there, then to continuously engage. For example, your examples of the queer Muslim project in India, and being kind of taken in, because there the intersection is even more, right? Because just not about religion, just not about your queer identity, but also an identity of being a Muslim in India, in today's India, and how does that intersection work? So there have been this multiple conversations which have been happening. I think we need to continu continuously engage with religion because that becomes, at least for the masses, that becomes an important kind of institution which they kind of engage on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. That's really interesting. I mean, sort of the, the point of, so, so on one hand, so religious fundamentalism and conservative forces are uh, pushing back against queer agendas. But on the other hand, I mean, as you mentioned, sort of uh, your activism or queer activism wants to engage with religion or, or needs to in, in, to some extent uh, in order to remain um, relevant or, or it can, and, and also to subvert um, uh, so what uh, Tessa was mentioning in her sort of definition of what is queer, so taking uh, a broad definition and trying to subvert through that. And um, I actually, yeah, if there were any further comments, um, Tessa, maybe you about the sort of the, the generational struggle that was the kind of um, another, is, is this, uh, is this is this opposition in your, uh, some of the artists that you discussed, they seem to be, many of them seem to be belonging to a younger generation. Is this a sort of a generational struggle or is this something that um, just to answer the address, the last question uh, that was asked? 
Yeah, I mean, firstly, um, just in response to uh, Rajesh's talk, you know, there's something I think really important about this no single issue struggle and the work of movement building that needs to be done, you know, against this kind of rising tide from the right. And I think that that is that very difficult kind of grassroots work of building coalitions across different interest groups is vital at the moment. Um, in terms of it being generational, I mean, my instant response to thinking about that is yes, absolutely. And to, if I think of my students' um, body and the way that the, the kind of the demographics have changed and the openness to queer issues in a way, but but actually, if I think about it more, I think it isn't like if I think about the feminist activists that I work with, for example, you know, and Sonia Correa would be one of them, um, and she is, I think, in her sixties, possibly. Um, and um you know I, I don't i don't think I, I think it's it's not that binary it's not about you know um i th i think it's much more complicated than that and i think that's connected to the idea that you know we know that social change and, and progress around these issues is not linear you know and so and and the fight is is an everyday one and will continue to be um and and i think that has been become painfully clear in the last decade you know the the human rights I mean, the, even even the 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 value of of human rights as as a, as a thing is is contested at the moment, right? Um, and so we have to do this very delicate balancing act of kind of critiquing um, to strengthen the rights framework, which people like Ratna Kapoor do really well, while while at the same time um, not wanting to destroy it, because as someone like Samuel Moyne would argue, it's 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 all we have, right? And so. Um, so I think we're in a very difficult position at the moment where, where, where there is an understanding that no, no, I don't think it's about generational stuff. I don't think that we have, I don't think we have arrived and I don't think we will arrive. I think that we, we, that, you know, unfortunately as exhausting as it is and <laughs> particularly in a post pandemic or not post pandemic actually world. Um, I think that, that, that struggle is, is one that, that will continue, um. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, and I guess that ties to what Joel was saying earlier that this takes time and that the, you know, sort of the non -linear, linear aspects of it, and we're, we're seeing that sort of so what becomes progress and it can change uh, quite, quite soon. Yeah, and maybe also there's some very interesting work being done around, firstly, in philanthropic, to uh, talk about the funding stuff. There's some amazing work being done by philanthropists, so GPP. Um, for example, I know the Elevate Children Funders Group, and they're thinking really hard about how to be more agile, how to fund without kind of heavy bureaucracies, how to fund children, um, you know, all these kinds of, of, of things. And I think there's some interesting work being done in that space. There's a lot more to do, obviously. Um, and I was gonna say something else, but it's disappeared, sorry. And, add, and to add to what Rajesh says, and also not just to fund agendas that come from the north or, or sort of northern perspectives, but rather fund agendas that are, you know, drawn from the everyday um, struggles or the everyday experiences of those who are actually working um, in those areas. Um, and and also yeah. maybe to break the north south binary you know i i i do think and i, and I know it's it's a queer reflex to to do that to not think in binaries but i do think that the decolonization needs to also grapple with a kind of um a, a new vision of of what development means in a way that includes kind of actors that not that those power dynamics are not real but but that are you know building a Kind of, there's a lot of work being done on new forms of activism, which I think is quite interesting. Regenerative activism, etc. But, but yeah, not thinking of north and south as as kind of oppositional binaries either. I think. Yeah, Rajesh, I, um, I don't know if you wanted to react to that, but uh, clearly your work is is very much focused on working class, um, um, the working class LGBTQ right, community. So it's not in that necessarily just global south but you're looking at various intersections of class caste and sexuality yeah i think it's difficult and i think to go back to the question of intergenerational for example right i think as the other speaker rightly pointed out it's a it's the dailiness of struggle for example it's not necessarily that when you have young people who kind of be more open to kind of engage 
with issue. For example, if you see at the mobilization of right wing groups, and you see that, you know, because in terms of whether it's Lao Jihad or groups against Valentine's Day and going out kind of beating out couples, it's always been young people in terms of the mobilizing. So, you know, it, this whole thing of they've been indoctrinated in terms of these views. So you also see that kind of mobilization which has been happening because agreed because it could be issues about employment it could be issues about the, then this whole thing of hatred because we have never at least seen at least the kind of hatred the kind of venom which has been spoken of and i think thanks to social media because the fake news industry is kind of being kind of uh, leveraged in terms of that so so it's i think we also need to look at these nuances in terms of our analysis now how do we really work with young people in terms of what we need to do with. But I think I think Sangma's work has primarily not been only between the divide of global north and global south. I really understand that there's also binary. I think recently I heard somebody also argues that there's also global south within the global north in terms of the issues, in terms of that. But for, for me, it's important in terms of the intersection because our work is primarily being with a street-based sex workers, for example, in terms of uh, working class, sexual and gender minorities, people who have no access uh, to education, for example, I consider even though I, I identify myself as queer, I consider myself as more a privileged lot because I have access to information, I have access to English, and I have access uh, to people uh, to people in power. But not many people would have those accesses. And I think how do you em I think where does empowerment really begin? And what is this old thing of knowledge? And how does knowledge kind of gets you know can kind of gets decentralized and how do we work with these communities and also the emergence i think one thing which i could say not necessarily kind of bragging about sangama is also the emergence of working class uh, leadership uh, in terms of i think to be then to be able to make i think the contribution has, has really been in terms of uh, having in terms of working class uh, sexual and gender minorities and sex workers leadership where really where people can really voice their opinion and then kind of fight the struggle also becomes a uh, very important i feel that in terms of kind of representing our own views so yeah thank you thank you uh, rajesh for that um so we just we just have a few minutes left and i yeah just to wrap up um, I would just wanted to uh, ask the speakers if they have anything that they would like to um, plug or promote or any kind of work, a link that you might want, um, uh, some, any, any, uh, anything that you would like us to post as a part of our, uh, you know, social media network in relation to this event. Um, if not, uh, that's totally fine as well. I, and we had, I had a last question, sort of um, anyone can answer this or in, in just short um, sentence is, so what is what is your wish for the future um, in development for queer people? Um, Joel, if you, if you have something to say. I think um, for especially the younger generation, because I think those are, you know, the people I can bank on um, to be more action oriented. Um, we have the gift of social media and new media, um, you know, podcasting and all those great things, but it's, it can be a double-edged sword. You can get so comfortable, you know, just talking, 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 which is in itself a great deal of awareness. But if we can marry that with concrete action, um, going out there, you know, to still do the work, no matter what, I think that is, you know, magic that can make a lot happen. Um, we must not forget the traditional um, way by which, you know, we have come this far, you know, we're talking about the suffragettes, you know, civil rights movement and all these things, you know, they really went out there to do the work, you know. Um, so we can, if we can find a balance between the online world and, you know, also the real life situation then married the two I think that's you know the best way to I think that, that's that's a good you know thing um yeah okay yeah, thank you yeah so basically joining together sort of the new technologies and the digital um, aspect of queer, queer activism with the kind of um yeah on the ground uh, organizing and protests and other uh, other activities it's, it's yeah. awesome most of the decision makers, especially in certain geographies like Africa and Nigeria, um, the gatekeepers, they are not, you know, on, they have social media and all of that, but it's been, it's not them, you know, doing all of that for the most part. 
they have people who aid to do all of that. So if you really want to meet with them and have this heart to heart and round table, you must, you know, either um, forcefully do that or, you know, within respect of their office to find a way to pass the message across the traditional way. And we're talking about maybe non-violent protest, um, you know, and all of that and galvanizing really um, and going out there to make, you know, your worries or your stance known um, to these people. Um, so that's that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Dessa, do you have, I saw that you you have some uh, project, really interesting projects in your paper that you put, put here. Do you have any final words on what would your wish be? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have quite a few bugbears about development at the moment. One, one is 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 that it becomes a kind of more creative space and and a less kind of bureaucratic one. Um, and and also, I and this is going to sound kind of hippie-ish, but I, I do, um, I. I think that there is a lot of kind of understandable prickliness and antagonism um, that it would be good to kind of work through on the left and 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 kind of I think that that our job now is is to figure out how to build strong coalitions uh, across different interest groups, and I don't think we've been very good at, at doing that. Um, so. I guess uh, my image of the future, no, no more right wing um, fascist gender restrictive um, governments. Yeah, I mean, the I, I feel like the political landscape looks quite bleak at the moment. And um, that's, yeah, I, I'd like I'd like a, a more hopeful one. Right. And um, finally, uh, Rajesh, do you have any um, sort of final words on sort of what would your um, what would your wish be for the future? You, you also spoke about the, the grim uh, political landscape in India at the moment and also in Karnataka, where, where you're based. Um, okay, so maybe uh, Radish is not uh, connected at the moment, it seems like. Um, maybe you can't hear me. Um, well, I think uh, I think it's uh, time to uh, sort of wrap up and, and thank our amazing uh, speakers. Uh, Rajesh, can you hear me? No? Yeah. Uh, no, Hi. I think the wish... Uh, sorry, I think... Go ahead, go ahead. I think, the, I think I just remember the words of Ambedkar, the architect of Indian constitution, organize, agitate, and educate. I think this is the time, I think especially in India, we're living in very kind of difficult times. I think our entire democracy and what the country has been really been stood for and it's whether it's secular ethos in terms of the diversity, I think that in itself, the idea of India itself is at stake. So it's educate, organize, and agitate would be in terms of the struggle to carry forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the inspiring end and it's always good to 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 hope and wish and, and to, to think optimistically um and thank you very much for uh, all our panelists for participating and our audience members who are here so um and we will keep you updated follow us on on social media and you'll um, get to know more about the events that we organize here at the igdc thank you very much and uh, goodbye